He's not on tonight, though. It's Nick Abbott at 10, and Ian Collins follows in about 40 minutes. Uh, now, we are joined in the studio by Nambila Ramdani, uh, Middle East commentator and journalist, and the wonderfully named Jonathan Sacerdotti. Um, I think I've nearly got that right. Anyway, uh, Middle East expert and former director of the Institute for Middle Eastern Democracy. Um, let's start off with a tw- an email from San Francisco, from Adam, who's listening online. He said, I thought your interviews with the Israeli and Palestinian spokespeople were great. I came away wondering what does Hamas actually want? My sense is that the opening of border crossings will not stop their attacking Israel. As sad as it sounds, I think they really want Israel gone, a one-state solution where they are in control. That probably means a long-term peace in the region is impossible, um, which is slightly depressing, but it... I, I, I'm not sure I agree with the detail of that, but the conclusion, I think, at the moment is irrefutable, that a long-term peace is, is further off than it's ever been probably in my lifetime. Jonathan, would you agree with that? I think it's quite hard to measure how far away a long-term peace is. I mean, it's like being a little bit pregnant. Either it's there or it's not. I wouldn't know. And uh, (laughs) I think... But your emailer is quite correct. You know, the Hamas Charter, which is their sort of raison d'etre put in a document, specifies quite clearly that they exist to ensure that Israel is destroyed. They don't want the state of Israel living side by side with a Palestinian state. Hamas are really, really clear about what they want. They want an end to the state of Israel and they want Palestine from the river to the sea, as we often hear chanted by anti-Israel protesters in the streets around the world as well. And what that means is that the state of Israel has to disappear before Hamas gives up what it calls armed resistance. And they see it as important that all their followers pursue armed resistance. They also specify in that founding document, which people can look up online, it's there for everyone to see, it's not secret, that armed resistance is the only way and they rule out any peaceful settlement, any peaceful discussions, any negotiations. They specifically say those things are out of the question and they furthermore say that Jews should be killed and that if a Jew is hiding behind a rock, the rock should climb out, it should cry out, uh, oh Abdullah, behind me is a Jew. And this is the enemy that Israel is dealing with at the moment. It's classified as a terrorist organization around the world, including in this country. And they are trying to deal with this very complex situation of an enemy that hides behind civilians as a a protective shield, an enemy that puts weapons in an UNRWA school like we saw in the last couple of days. A UN-run school is used as a weapon store in the Gaza Strip. And it is within that climate that Israel is trying to protect its own civilians by stopping these tunnels which come into the country for the kidnapping and killing of Jews, as has happened uh, in the past. And it is in that climate that they have okay. to try to defend their civilian now, population. Now, Bella, when, when you listen to Jonathan talking in those terms, it's pretty difficult to say, well, Israel shouldn't be concerned by what Hamas want and what Hamas have done. Well, actually, I would, you know, in theory, what Jonathan just said about Hamas's charter and, uh, you know, the aim t- not to see the existence of a state of Israel is quite correct. The reality is Israel does exist. And the other reality is, uh, in practical terms, Hamas has just joined, uh, you know, a unity government with the uh, Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, um, headed by uh, President Abbas. So we are seeing practical moves by Hamas. And that practical moves effectively means that Hamas wants to be part of, of Palestine. It doesn't want, you know, a divided Palestine in in the uh, instance where uh, Palestine would, you, you, you know, we would come and talk about a united um, uh, Palestine. Now, uh, as far as the immediate demands uh, that Hamas uh, is making, uh, they are pretty clear. They want a lift of the blockade of the Gaza Strip that has been in place for seven years. And unless you visited the place or, in, well, even now you can see it, you know, on social media, on your on a television screens, you, you know, you, you have to bear in mind the reality of what it is to live on the Gaza Strip. Well, well is that true? We, we had somebody earlier on say, well, there are five star hotels. There are there are completely westernized shopping malls in Gaza. It's not this sort of uh, almost refugee camp that, that people allege. Well, I, I would, you know, absolutely dispute that. This is a, 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 
um, you know, um, the most densely populated area in the world, it arguably. Isn't. It uh, one, isn't, though, factually. It, one, one of the maybe, most, but not factually. W- one of the most. Uh, there are quite a number which are more, including many cities in Europe, like Paris, for example. 1.8 million people, you know, squeeze on a s- tiny strip of land. Not uh, the densest no, population uh, in the world. With, um, you know, Israel effectively still, in, you know, in control of that area, controlling water and electricity supplies, the movement of people, the movement of goods, uh, the circ- you know, uh, er- controlling all the borders, sea borders, air borders, land not borders, all the borders as well. Egypt has a border, and actually, which it, it controls, not Israel. And that border is also closed. Which, to have a military dictator in Egypt doesn't help, you know, to allow the freedom... Uh, um, the free movement of people. But unless, unless um, the Israeli government address the underlying, the fundamental underlying issues, and it has to be stated, you know, people probably don't know about the wider picture. It, it's hard to believe that they wouldn't know. Well, I think they are true, dealing Jonathan. with the fundamental well, issues. Well, re- really, what, yes, what, 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 what about the, the continuing issues. illegal settlements that, that Israel... I mean, that, that is what really angers, I think, a lot of Palestinians, um, that, that, that even now there are new homes being built on territories that actually do not belong to Israel. So we'll, I'll answer your point about the disputed territories in just one moment. But what I'll say is that, that Israel is trying to deal with the underlying issues. And those underlying issues are actually a terror enclave sponsored and armed by Iran, which also has a genocidal intent on Israel, attacking Israel from that territory. That's very clearly what is the essential issue to be dealt with here. At the point at which Hamas would have agreed, for example to the ceasefire agreement put to them the other day, uh, a couple of days ago, by Egypt, which was backed by the Arab League, not famous for being a pro-Israel organisation. The problem was it wasn't put to them. I know, I've heard all of that before, though, but let's just... just, I mean, it was or it wasn't. Listen, it was put to them. Um, They rejected it. They rejected it squarely in words and in deeds and, and pursued a barrage of rockets afterwards. They had no intention of stopping, and they still have no intention of stopping. Right now, I have on my phone in front of me an application called Red Alert Israel. Anyone can download it, and they can see every single incoming rocket into Israel, which have been going on all day, every day, four days. And that's why Israel's engaged here. But let me just say quickly, Very quickly. When, when Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip in 2005, they were dealing with exactly the point you just made, which is people were saying, this is because of an occupation. This is because you're living in our land. And the Israeli army ripped Jews out of their homes and synagogues who didn't want to leave. They removed all Israeli presence from that place. And what they got in return after and still thousands and thousands of greenhouses were left and to build an industry, okay. they don't control it. They control the flow of weapons and tools to be building these these concrete tunnels going into Israel. They control those things. They do let in thousands of tons of aid, of food. They they treat people who well, are in Gaza, in Israeli, I, I in Israeli hospitals. I, I, it's I want, impossible I want to, get, to say they I want have to a get siege. one call in, in this quarter we, and then we're going to have some more in the next. Let's go to Hess, who's in Twickenham. Hello, Hess. Oh, hello, Ian, and, and thank you so much for having me on, and thank you to Kess. Um, I, I'd just like to, the, if I could just please make... Um, uh, a few uh, quick points, I'd be grateful. Uh, the first thing, obviously, I think the situation in Gaza I need, needs to end. And I think, um, unfortunately, both sides have been quite irresponsible with the language and we're not trying to resolve the conflict. I think that needs to be really put high on the agenda. I think seeing children being killed on a beach is just not acceptable. I agree with Nick Clegg when he was on LBC earlier in the week. There has to be an element of proportionality. Israel obviously has a right to defend herself, but I think so do but, the But Palestine. only up to a point. Up to a point. I think Palestine is now a UN non-member state, recognised by the vast majority of countries in the world, and I think Israel needs to respect that. Instead of punishing Palestine for joining UN agencies, which it has a right to do, and trying to undermine President Abbas, who the European Union and the United States government wholeheartedly support. I think they they should try and cut a deal with President Abbas in Palestine and end this conflict. The expansion of settlements, I think, is just unacceptable. Abbas uh, the is European calling Union for the Union have the made, rockets. If I could please just say something. I mean, the European Union has warned uh, its citizens against trade with settlement. This is something which has come through. Um, also... People may forget that, um, the, as far as the United Nations are concerned, in the uh, Coordinator for Humanitarian Affairs in uh, April of this year, uh, had condemned Israel for its continuous uh, siege in Gaza. Uh, the United Nations has repeatedly said this. 
the international court in that Hague has demanded that Israel's 420-mile separation barrier be removed. Israel has ignored the ruling of the international court in the Hague. Ignores 420 the mile. But, I don't think it's quite and, that long. And is think it? of it another. Is. Is it? Think yes. of another non-military barrier. action that can stop 90 percent of the suicide bombings that took place before that fence was in place. The reason that fence is there, nobody wants it there. The Israelis don't want it there. The Palestinians don't want it there. But until the moment it was properly constructed. People frequently left the Palestinian territories, went into nightclubs and buses and cafes and pizza parlours like we have here in London and blew themselves up, killing Israeli civilians. Right. That's why it's there. Now, but find a word from you in this part. Yes, you, I think people have to bear in mind the reason why people get radicalised. And it's a very simple reason. The more you oppress people, the more you radicalise them. It is unacceptable and unbearable that in this day and age we have the longest military occupation in modern history, 47 years. And let's make no mistake about what this crisis is all about. It is not tit for tat between Hamas and Israel. It's about the wider picture. It's about a free and independent state, independent state for but the it, Palestinians. But in the, in the short term, it is about tit for and tat, you have isn't to it? Prove but, but we, if you want a state, you don't act as a terrorist entity and include that in a unity government if you want to be treated right. as a responsible state. Okay, we will have more of your calls to come. More from Nabella and Jonathan. Uh, this is Ian Dale at Drive, LBC News Time. It's seven thirty-one. Motorists, we salute you this summer. 7.37 here on LBC. You're listening to Ian Dale at Drive. Um, now, we're taking your calls on what's happening in Gaza and also uh, Ukraine. Let's cross live to Ukraine and talk to Simon Ostrovsky, reporter for Vice News. He's currently in Ivium in eastern Ukraine. Simon, good evening. Now, what, what's the mood there at the moment? I think... People are still trying to figure out exactly what happened. Everybody wants to know what the real details are of this jet coming down because so much hinges on who's to blame. Uh, because if it is indeed the Russia-backed separatists uh, who fired that rocket that um, shot that plane out of the sky, then they'll be held to pay for them. And um, people want to know that. Now, you yourself were captured by the rebels. You understand um, the sort of merciless brutality under which they operate. Did did you believe they, they, they were capable of this kind of attack? Well, they're definitely capable uh, in terms of having the equipment uh, to carry out such an attack because they've been uh, shooting down Ukrainian uh, military cargo planes over the past couple of weeks, and before that they were shooting down quite a few Ukrainian helicopters with different equipment um, called man pads. So they've been knocking things out of the sky um, for over a month now. Uh, and I'm not going to say that they were capable of you know, carrying out an attack uh, on purpose against the civilian aircraft. I have no idea uh, if they were trying to aim for one. I think probably not. I think it was if it was indeed the uh, Russia pact separatists, then, um, you know, they probably would have been trying to shoot down a Ukrainian plane. So this may have been a mistake. If it is proved to have been them, um, what, what are the consequences for them? Because do you think they would be disowned then by uh, the Russian government and President Putin? They're, they're definitely getting arms from Russia. Uh, So if enough pressure is put on Russia by the international community um, to uh, stop giving them arms, that would weaken them significantly. Uh, I think up until now, Ukraine has been pushing for uh, the world to uh, do more to stop Russia from arming them and hasn't actually gotten quite a lukewarm response because all Ukraine has seen, especially from uh, the European Union, um, has been some lukewarm uh, sanctions that target a few individuals and don't actually put a large amount of pressure uh, on Russia. Ukraine has officially asked um, Western powers to arm it. Uh, Western powers haven't armed it, um, and so so I think that uh, you know the, the pressure on the rebels could increase that way. Okay, Simon, thank you very much. That's Simon Ostrovsky from Vice News reporting for us uh, from Ivium in eastern Ukraine. It's uh, 20 to 8. John is in Mill Hill. Hello, John. Hello, Ian. Um, Several weeks ago, um, LBC had an expert, foreign affairs expert on. I'm not sure if he was on your show or on um, another time of day. But 
he made the point, I thought it was a very good one, that if Obama and Cameron and the rest had been clever, um, they'd have actually cozied up more to Putin and got him more as one of the one of the boys, one of the club, and uh, and just made things a lot more friendly or inviting for him. Uh, I mean, the, ironically, the old Arab uh, saying that have your friends close, but your enemies closer. Uh, is true, and I well, think I think that, that you see that I'm not sure I agree with you, John, because I think they, I think that was tried before George Bush uh, tried that uh, with yeah, Vladimir Bush. Putin, didn't he? <laughs> but well, and, and indeed, so did Tony Blair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I rest my case, Bush and Blair. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, you can't have it both ways. You either think all international <laughs> leaders should cozy up to each other, or none of them should. No, I think they should. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think we should. I, I mean, what have we got to lose? I think had we done that more. There'd be much more of a chance of him <laughs> condemning what's happened if it has happened at all, well, and and trying to do something about it. I think you do have a point to the extent that I think international leaders who get on on a personal level can achieve um, quite a lot, and we we have seen that in the past. Um, if you remember back in 1984 when Margaret Thatcher met um, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev for the first time, she said, "This is a man we can do business with," and so it proved. Um, I, I'm not sure that uh, President Putin is is particularly receptive to people who try to charm him, though, it has to be said. Uh, would you agree with that, uh, Nabil, Nabila Mandani, who's with us? Sorry, I was a bit distracted. <laughs> would, would, you, would you agree that President Putin isn't receptive to people who try to charm him? Well... Uh I think he he quite likes that he quite uh, he quite likes you know be, being charmed but he also likes to to stand uh, apart if you like from the international community he want he doesn't want to be one of the boys he doesn't want to be part of the club I think that's you know he he's quite happy in his own uh, um, sphere of of influence and and in fact quite enjoys uh, challenging uh, the world only superpower the the United States and and its and its allies. So um, Jonathan Sacerdotti, he's he's a little bit like the, he's sort of the Millwall of Russia. So no one likes him and he doesn't care. I think one of the things that we can draw as a conclusion from what's happening now and from this terrible tragic incident with the airliner is related to what you said earlier on, Ian, which is to say we're looking now at the consequences of a foreign policy, especially on the part of the United States, but also the West at large, which believes in not intervening where it feels there's a need, but in trying somehow to do intervention light by giving support and arms even to what they call rebel causes, who they feel are on the right side. But when you do that, you don't have actual control over what those people are going to do with those weapons. Now, whether it's Putin giving, con giving that sort of support in this instance to separatists, or whether it is uh, the United States giving support to the rebels in Syria, I think what we're seeing is that some of the worst atrocities that people have seen in the news for many years are taking place at the hands of those people with weapons that have been supplied to them by those who didn't want proper intervention. And in fact, what we can see from the Israel situation is that a country like Israel fully understands this and knows that sometimes the only solution to deal with those sorts of problems is boots on the ground. It doesn't take that lightly, but it's sent in troops because that's the only way it feels it can sort right. out the terrorist organisation. Let's talk to uh, Fatima in Watford. Hello, Fatima. Hello, how are you? Fine. What would you like to tell me? Oh, I'm, I'm just so devastated and I'm so angry. I'm just, I've been, for the past few days, I've just been crying non-stop because of what's happening in Palestine. Children, small, small children, it's so very, very sad. And when it comes to the MH17, um, I'm sorry for all the families that have lost their loved ones. When that happened, David Cameron, Obama, everyone was getting involved. Everyone was having meetings. I haven't seen anyone having meetings about Israel and Palestine. See, that, that, I, that I think, that. is a really good point because mm. the, the, I think the, the Security Council, wasn't there a call for the Security Council to meet at the United Nations about um, the airliner? Um, that hasn't happened about what's happening in Gaza, has it, Jonathan? Well, the UN does have uh, a particularly... Uh, bad record on uh, re in relation to Israel. I mean, it often... No, but fr from that point of view, you'd have thought they would have wanted to have a meeting. Indeed, you might. But I think what we're finding, especially in this uh, incident between Israel and uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, is unlike previous operations, in fact, there's been quite a great deal of international support. Barack Obama, speaking uh, just today, actually said that, you know, he is, is encouraging Israel to continue 
uh, trying to prevent the loss of innocent lives. So in, su- in saying that, he's really more or less shown that he actually does believe they are trying to do that. And what's fundamentally uh, important about what Fatima has just said on the phone is that it is a huge tragedy to see any children, any civilians dying in the way that we are. But what we have to ask ourselves is, why is this happening? And the reason that this is happening is that Hamas is using those children as a sort of human shield. We know that argument. Um, Nabila, very briefly, why isn't the UN doing more on this? Well, it's absolutely shocking that the international community as a whole, and especially world leaders, are not doing anything. It took a week in the UK for uh, MPs to raise the issue in in Parliament, for instance. What we are seeing is the difference between uh, governments who are buying into the chilling PR spin and indeed supporting the violence of Israel. Let's not forget that it's the fourth most powerful army in the world, um, backed by the only uh, world superpower, the, the United States of America. But a public opinion around around the world is absolutely, uh, you know, uh, shocked by the lack of response by the international community. And that's why we're seeing thousands and thousands of people taking to the streets around the world to get the governments to say something and to react in, in the face of okay. s- such uh, atrocities. Um, two interesting tweets here, and that they, they sort of illustrate how um, the, these things work. Uh, uh, we have Cyber Rebels saying, Ian Dale, I can't believe you're giving Zionist murderers a, pl- a platform to spread propaganda. Shame on you, Ian. The entire world is disgusted. And then we have Jamil, who says, I haven't always seen eye to eye with him, but Ian Dale's really on fire at the moment. Some great radio analysis, balanced and provocative. There you go. You pays your money, you takes your choice. This is LBC at 7.47. BC. That's Ian Collins at 8, and Nick Abbott will be here from 10. It's nine minutes to 8. We have Jonathan Sacerdotti with us, former director of the Institute for Middle Eastern Democracy, and Nabila Ramdani, Middle East commentator and journalist. And Natasha is in Canary Wharf. Hello, Natasha. Hi, good afternoon. Ian, what's important to remember is that this is not a chicken and egg scenario and presenting it as such with the phrase of both sides is horrendously misguided. Ian, there is a blockade because of terror attacks, not the other way around. And we know what came first. We know that there are controls on materials going into Gaza in order to stop materials for rockets getting to Hamas, getting to Islamic Jihad and other Palestinian terrorist organisations. We know that there's a wall because of the suicide bombings which ripped through Israeli civilian populations before the uh, security barrier was built. And we also have the evidence, you mustn't forget, that Hamas doesn't want an end to this, or at least so it would appear, because every time Israel says, stop firing, and there will be an end to this. Every time Netanyahu says, quiet will be answered with quiet, the barrages of rockets fired by Palestinian terrorists... OK, look, we've heard population. all of these arguments, Natasha. I want you to have a conversation with Nabila Ramdani, who's in the studio with me. Um, Nabila, what do you I'd make of what to. Natasha has said? Well, I'll be quite factual. The facts speak for themselves. There you have the figures. More, Over 270 Palestinians have been killed. More than 80% of them are civilians. Schools have been bombed. Hospitals have been bombed. Homes have been bombed. Centres for disabled people have been bombed. Uh, Children have been killed on the beach. Whatever your take on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whatever your views on this conflict, no matter what your religion, no matter what your cultural background, you cannot kill children as a means to a solution. There cannot be any moral justification. But you can't defend weapons with children. um, I, 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 hang on, I right. want to have if, Natasha if may, have this conversation. Go on, Natasha. If I may, the figures mean nothing without the proper context. Now, you don't seem to be it's very keen to hear earlier that Hamas It's absolutely to hear somebody shield. saying that the figures mean nothing. But it is nothing. the case that Hamas human rights abuses are the cause of these horrendous civilian casualties that we are seeing. Israel does not target children. Israel does not target civilians. Unlike Hamas, which puts civilians in the front line, which puts them on top of bunkers in order to protect the bombs that it places under well, the bunkers. Just, just on, just on that point about um, putting uh, people in the, in the front line, um, Nabilo, I know you wanted to say something about that. Yes, I think I'll go back to the facts again. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Hamas is using people as human children. Yes, there is. Ian, Sorry, it's a question of... Have you been watching Hamas videos from Gaza? <laughs> Can I have a word? I mean, 
It's a question where, of where semantics. Where do you get your evidence from? Because you is... also seem to have a very skewed idea of what's going on in there. Are you, are you watching the reports on Al Jazeera at the moment that show civilians being pushed onto, bo- on, onto the top of rooftops so that the Israeli Air Force doesn't strike them because there are weapons caches within these buildings? It that is... A... is a double war crime that they are committing by putting... OK, let, let, Nabil, let, let Nabila have a word. It is a question of semantics. Either you call, you call children whatever you like. You can call them human chills. You can call them children playing on the beach. You can call them children sitting on their mother's laps. You can call them children visiting their families for uh, dinner after a day of fasting. The problem with a tiny community like Gaza is that all these terms tend to get mixed up. And if you're happy... And if you feel happy to attribute to Hamas as allowing children to be murdered for their cause, then that's up to uh, to you. On a purely practical level, I would find that extremely surprising. Arabs live in close-knit communities. And I think that if any political group and indeed military group made it known that they were effectively killing local children as part of the campaign, I don't think that they would retain much popular appeal. And yet Hamas is extremely popular in Gaza. Fundamental to this. Well, extremely popular. They're so popular they haven't held another election since the one that they completely lapsed. They are part lapsed. of a unity government. Comple- and yes, but Abbas also hasn't held an election for many years. No, Nobody has a democratic mandate to represent the Palestinians. But back to that issue on, on using children and using civilians. It's hard to fathom Hamas's behaviour at the moment. It's sacrificing the lives of innocent civilians of Gaza on the altar of international opinion. It failed with its rockets, almost all of which were intercepted. It failed with its frogmen sent into Israel through the sea. It failed with its drones. It failed by rejecting the Egyptian ceasefire proposal backed by the Arab leagues. And so their secret weapon, the only thing they've got left, is trying to draw public opinion from the world to condemn Israel for trying to stop the terrorists by targeting the weapons which they then put okay, civilians on okay, top of. OK, right. I'm going to take a call from Aboud. In Ch- Natasha, thank you for your call. Let's go to Aboud in Chelsea. Hello. Yes, hello. Hi, go ahead. Yeah, I think really uh, I'm, I'm talking about Jonathan, I think. I think there's a lot of distortion uh, Abu, you need to talk into your mouthpiece, otherwise we can't hear you. Yes, Israel is an occupying force, and uh, Gaza is under occupation from Israelis, so it's the West Bank. Israel withdrew in 2005 from Gaza. And it still controls it in every possible way. It has a border with Egypt as well. Look, can we let the caller actually speak, otherwise we won't hear his point. Abu, carry on. Since 1967, right, Israel has been occupying the West Bank and Gaza, and they have subjected the people of Gaza and the West Bank to all sorts of, of really terrorism, if you want to call it. And, uh, and uh, when every, anybody talks about, they talk about Israel as if it's uh, the, the peaceful lamb that is uh, being attacked by everybody else. Israel is the most powerful force in the Middle East, the only nuclear force in the Middle East. It's supported by the only superpower in the world. Okay, and if you dare talk against Israel, then you are really destroyed. Anybody who talks against Israel is destroyed. The fact of the matter is, if you want to have peace in the Middle East, Israel should have a known borders, which hasn't got until now. It should really get right. the Abu, 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 thank you very much. We literally only got 40 seconds left, so I'm going to give you 15 seconds each. Jonathan. Abu is wrong. Israel is a country that, from the day it was founded, all of its Arab neighbours did try to attack it and wipe it out. That's why it has a formidable military, in order to defend its civilians. And Israel has made peace with Arab nations, with Egypt and with Jordan. And what they need now is a Palestinian leader to be as brave and make peace with them. War happens, and of course it does, and we've experienced terrorism from the British man- mainland very recently, but imagine if we replied to a terrorist outrage by destroying men, women and children in the community where those terrorists are set to come from, there would be an okay. international outrage. What is happening is collective punishment. Thank you both for being with us for the last hour. It's been a sparky last hour to the programme. Now, I'm off for a week now. I hope you'll be nice to John Stapleton. He's sitting in for me all next week. Uh, coming up at 10, it's Nick Abbott. But next, it's Ian Collins. Ian, thank you. Uh, we will, of course, pick up on the back of those comments from President Obama. Has that act of terrorism now prompted the president and the West, of course, to take action? Has this tragedy now become 
the West's problem, given Russia's sympathies with those allegedly responsible. Should now the UK, America and others take on a kind of global policing role around all of this? Would this minimise the chances of any such terrorist activities reoccurring? 0345 60 60 973. The lines are open now from LBC. This is Ian Collins and it all starts next.